that's uh, I think we've been put we've been put on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think this time I won't uh, talk from the calf. I have a few uh, questions that uh, I prepared, which I thought probably people would be interested to uh, to to listen to. Some of which may be uh, you're also wondering about this uh, great master of Africa. I must say, uh, really. I'm very grateful, I think I should echo those uh, sentiments, to have been uh, given this privilege to come and uh, uh, speak, or to come and be here uh, at uh, Kunstabanken, and in particular, to come and uh, discuss, uh, thank you, to, to first of all, open the show, and to come and uh, discuss I must also say that you would be interested to know what goes on behind the curtains. I was very thrilled to be here earlier to watch and participate in the hanging of these sculptures that you have seen here. Uh, I have the first question for Errol, and the first question reads as follows. Elan Asui, the great artists, you have just won the Golden Lion Award at Venice Biennale for the sake of this audience here gathered in Hama for that matter. Who is Elan Asui? That's a big one. Yeah, I must say that's a very big one because uh, I don't know how I'm putting Yeah, I must say that's a really big one because I don't know how I'm putting a, a 71 years into a few words. And uh, 71 years, most of which I did not understand. <laughs> and then I'm asked to talk about <laughs> it. Just well, but I, was, I was born in a, a, a peninsula. You know, when I came to Hama, I think I was very excited with the, the, the hotel they put me in, which has a, a lake view, and it reminded me of my hometown, which is a peninsula in Ghana, uh, called Anyako, and uh, lived my childhood in and around there, you know, then uh, went to the university, also in Ghana, and after that, had lived in Ghana and later on in Nigeria. <coughs> so those are the two places that I've lived in. My education, everything was done in Ghana. And then my career mostly has been in Nigeria. And uh, also have traveled all over the place, especially of late. You know, so I've gotten to know the rest of the world apart from my, in addition to my little uh, village <laughs> and uh, my country and Nigeria that I've uh, worked, uh, lived and worked in so far. Maybe that might be okay for now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Um, I want to tell you something um, which happened to me. Uh, just to try and uh, help this audience understand the extent of your influence on the continent. Uh, we have international art workshops that have been uh, promoted and propagated by the Triangle Trust. So we invite artists from all over the place and uh, they come and participate in a workshop. I didn't go to that particular workshop, I went to the exhibition to see the results of that uh, workshop and I walked in and there were some plaques lying on the floor, some sculptures. And I looked at them and I said, whoever has done this work has something to do with Insuka and Helena Sui. And that was a smooth in Zewe. And this leads me to 
the next question, which is, you have spent most of your life living and working in Nigeria. Why did you settle in Insuka in particular? Well, I don't know. <laughs> uh, people expect me to have settled elsewhere now. Maybe I should be asking them where. <laughs> that's a good question. Yeah, that, 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 that was a place that I got uh, well uh, appointed to teach in a university and uh, I went there and saw a very uh, fertile place, you know. Uh, I went to Nigeria in 1975, that's just a few years after the end of the Civil War and uh, as a result of which, uh, Almost anybody who had, who, who, who is who, in any uh, area of uh, academia, you know, from the side of Nigeria, which was at war with the rest, you know, had returned home. So you had a, such a concentration of, of very great minds, you know, in that uh, uh, institution. You know, when I went there, my idea was to do maybe three years and after that go back home. And after end of three years, I thought so they, they, they would need to stay more with that rich field of people. You know, and so I kept renewing my contract and so and at the same time developing my career as well. You know, uh, the University of Nigeria where I uh, taught for almost uh, 36 years is in a rural countryside and and being in the countryside it was very ideal very peaceful and uh, and quiet and therefore it was good ground for me to have grown in you know and I'm uh, not surprised that uh, it had provided an enabling atmos atmosphere which has enabled my uh, career to, to grow. You know. Yeah, um, Helen, how have you resisted uh, the temptations of moving to the Western metropolis? Because I think the artists well, of your I, generation... I grew, up, <laughs> I, grew up, I grew up mostly in the countryside. Oh, okay. And therefore, I always uh, regarded the metropolis or the cities, big cities, as uh, places that you go to only once and uh, spend a couple of maybe hours or days and and come back to the you know peace and quietude of the countryside. As a professor of art, sculpture, a master of form shape, space, color, scale, a user of materials of your own creative desire and choice. How have you managed to transgress and transcend the notions of African art as being traditional carvings? How? Yeah. Yeah, well, maybe we we'll call them traditional carving, but then if one looks closely, you see that they're not just traditional carving. Uh, when I was introduced to uh, art from Africa, you know, which wasn't part of the curriculum of the school in which I trained in Ghana, you know, weren't they close to it at all, but after, after school, uh, a couple of us uh, who were desirous of knowing about our own artistic heritage and our own uh, artistic heirloom uh, sought to search for samples of what we could call art in our own uh, environment, you know. Uh, we had learned about European art, you know, and uh, occasionally art from Asia and some other places but not African uh, art. So, uh, my uh, first discovery of art from my locality, it was a body of, uh, uh, I'll call them uh, 
ideograms or signs. I think one of them is on your. Yeah. <laughs> this one. Yeah, thank you for wearing this. <laughs> yeah. Which uh, uh, have meanings or have ideas, they are based on ideas, you know, and uh, I was intrigued by them because, uh, incidentally, before I chanced upon them, upon them, we had learned about the European uh, Renaissance and, and learned about the Giotos and the Paolo Uccellos and uh, perspective and all that, you know, that's trying to look at the world physically, you know. And then I chanced upon these which were working more with ideas, you know. This is the omnipotence of God or the oneness of God. Then I tried to kind of uh, study this. I spent quite, quite about uh, many years, about four, four or five years, you know, working with trying to maybe copy or go through the motions that the artists would have gone in creating them, you know, and trying to understand why they uh, are based on certain ideas, you know, like this. Uh, they say uh, omnipotence of God, uh, the oneness of God. Uh, if you count it, it has about, uh, well, if it's well done, it should have 10 points. And 10 is unity. You know, so this kind of thing intrigued me about this uh, uh, body of, uh, of science and uh, ideograms. And I went on to work with them for, when I, when I had finished art school, I knew that I wasn't going to work with uh, uh, what school uh, taught me. School is just to introduce you to things and after that, that you should be able to uh, uh, forge your own path and uh, move on. And uh, the path that I took was right from these ones, you know, Learning about that, that's why uh, even up to now I've not worked much with uh, the figure, which was what we were really brought up in in, in, in art school. We were busy doing life studies and still lives and such things, you know, uh, which were based mostly on the on the curriculum of the art school in England, which my school was affiliated with. You know, the curriculum was. Uh, largely uh, that one. And I knew that uh, as an artist, I have to work with material that I find from my own uh, environment and move uh, with that. Yeah, um, I, I think on that note, I must also say that it brings me now to the most recent uh, works uh, that are so monumental and unleash a fabric perception to the viewer, despite having been made out of metallic, small metallic pieces like the bottle stop, uh, tops, how do you manage to come up with these ideas or projects as executed and monumental as the ones that we are seeing here? Uh, well, these are not quite monumental yet. <laughs> well, when you talk about monumental, then I'm thinking about things like uh, the piece I did on the High Line in New York, which actually was an adaptation or an enlargement of an earlier one I did in Paris, uh, which was called the Broken Bridge, uh, which was uh, on the, well, when I, m most of the times I would, uh, when invited, go to site visit the place and, uh, see what ideas the place can generate or engender in me and uh, maybe from that work on. When I was invited to uh, Paris to create this, they were shown a place uh, which was uh, it's, uh, a museum of cult of uh, fashion, or the museum of fashion, I think they call it Galleria. Mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, was to create the work for the facade of that whole building. 
and uh, so the ideas of fashion, you know, were what I started with. And uh, in thinking about fashion, I uh, well thought about okay, what are things that go with fashion? And the first idea that came at the time, I have been thinking about uh, working with more with materials which have something to do with the history you know, of, uh, of Africa in relation to the rest of the world, especially Europe, you know. And uh, the one, one, of, one, of, one of which is the bottle tops, you know, now it serves as a link between, between the two uh, continents, not only the two continents, but also America, you know. And, and I think, because they, when uh, the early Europeans came to Africa to trade, by butter, they brought goods, and among them were drinks, you know, and among them also were mirrors. So the idea of the mirror came in there. And mirror is a very good uh, uh, accessory for fashion. You can't be talking about fashion without, or you can't be dressing up or, you know, <laughs> do anything without a mirror. <laughs> And the mirror too has that historical link between Africa and Europe. And since I was invited to create this work in, in Europe, in, in Paris, I thought I should use the mirror. And uh, I combined the mirror with, uh, with some rusty metal graters. You know, there are holes on them. And, Actually, they are about food, you know, so I was thinking about food and fashion, you know, and, <laughs> and the fact that food, looking for food, is what brings people into trading and therefore linking up with or traveling to other places and linking up with people. So, and uh, also, the place I was shown, uh, after looking at it and turning, I saw that I could see the, the what's the name of the big, uh, this thing in, in Paris? Eiffel Tower. <laughs> the Eiffel Tower, I consider uh, a big fashion statement of Paris. You can't be talking about Paris, uh, Eiffel Tower without anybody thinking about Paris. You know, so I thought, okay, the mirror comes in very well because the work is facing the Eiffel Tower, therefore the Eiffel Tower would be reflected in it. In other words, I was going to uh, show Paris to itself, you know, through the Eiffel Tower, you know. So all those ideas uh, coalesced into the piece that I did, you know, using all those materials. And of course the scale, uh, is detected by the, the size of the, the support. That is the whole facade of the building that I was uh, asked to uh, work with. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Uh, you, uh, you are a person of incredible humility and you exude this character everywhere you are. This is the second time you are exhibiting at Kunstebank and Headmark. And this, I think, is one of those questions that is permeating through most of the reactions that you're getting here. The first time was 2008 in a group summer show. And now it's your big solo after this big awards. Why here in Hama? Why not Oslo? Why well, not I, <laughs> Well, because Oslo did uh, approach me to come and exhibit in Oslo. <laughs> but Hama approached me and it, 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 it wasn't like they say come and then I came. It, it, it took quite some, uh, some exchange, you know, of uh, this thing. And I must say that I uh, admire the tenacity of of the staff <laughs> of this place. Who, who wouldn't give up? They wouldn't give up. You know. <laughs> and so finally, I have to 
said, okay, I'm coming. Oh, and, wow. and, uh, <laughs> well, having shown here once and uh, having seen the place and I seem to like it, though it also helped, you know. Uh, but then I don't see why uh, one cannot exhibit in a place like this when, you know, there are people here and, uh, you know, they have had a center here for many years and therefore they would have an art audience. You know, uh, city audiences are okay, but they might have too many things that they are concerned with as well, but an audience here would be more dedicated probably than uh, the one in a city, you know, with so many things to contend with. And as an artist, you don't want to uh, have your work only collected. You know, so I'm not here to, well, to be collected only. And there's like a good place that one can come, you know, and feel free to exhibit and people approach the art as art and not as objects to be collected. You know, hmm. that goes to register your humility. It's incredible. I share your thoughts, and I'm sure the audience does. It's really incredible to have an artist of the earth's stature, you know, sharing these thoughts. Uh, maybe now that we are in Hama and the work is in Hama, could you just kindly shed some light? one or two of these pieces that are on display here? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know if I can say shed light on any particular one on display here because uh, my way of working is, and I, will, I think it goes for all artists too, for most artists, is that uh, you don't quite understand what you've done until after so many Yes, mm -hmm. you know, I've had occasions where people, uh, a museum collected my work, or mu certain museums have collected my work, and they, uh, what was the title? I said, I don't know. So they kept it untitled. And recently, about 10 years later, I was able to give a title to one of them, you know, uh, which means that I was able to understand a bit of what uh, I was trying to do in the work. So rather than talk about particular pieces here, maybe I would just uh, generally say what, I, what, what I've been doing, you know, especially with this uh, uh, media. Mm -hmm. This medium of uh, bottle caps and, and, and copper wire, and <laughs> you know, uh, <coughs> probably even before then, I had worked with wood, and I worked in slabs. You know, that were individual pieces that you put together into a composition, and uh, then you would have uh, numbers and uh, <coughs> yeah, sequence. You know that I suggest behind each of them. So as to help you arrange it. But that is meant to be a beginning, not the end. It's just to tell you what I'm uh, thinking of at a beginning, but that you have the freedom to uh, rearrange the resequence, you know, and get something uh, different out of the data that are provided, I call them data. These are data because uh, they are capable of uh, uh, being uh, manipulated by almost anybody who wants to. Yeah, this is a freedom that I give, you know, or that the, the, the mode of working from the wood through to this, you know, as uh, provided. But from me, I've seen that given freedom most human beings don't take it. <laughs> they don't take the freedom, so they don't. <laughs> so the wood pieces, they still keep to the the sequencing that, that I did at the beginning. You know, in other words, the human beings want to be dictated to. You tell them, okay, 
this is a beginning. What do you do with it? They won't do, you know. Uh, like this uh, uh, bottle cap pieces, uh, the, the, the sculptures are free form, I call them free form sculptures, free form because they don't have, or they are not limited to one particular form. On the, on the stretch, they are, they might have a particular form, but then that's not the end. They are capable of being, you know, played with and sculpted in so many ways as you, uh, the, uh, you can think about and uh, you know that freedom to a lot of people don't uh, take it and so what I do most of the time is to send the work to people without any instructions, instructions or anything and let them uh, grapple with especially if I'm not going to be there you know and, <laughs> and I see that is yielding results because in places you go and they have done very, very great. They were able to relate to, to the pieces well and uh, get good results out of the results that I wouldn't have gotten myself, you know. So that way too, it helps me also learn more about, yeah, these uh, pieces and uh, how to even uh, work more with them in the studio, you know. So that's the the major thing that I want to say about the, the this piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the Western art world has canonized itself with a perception of what African art history knowledge ought to be. What do you think your art success have done to the canon of the Western world. Rather, what statement do you think artists living on the African continent are making to the rest of the world? Uh, well, I don't know. I don't know whether I'm successful or anything. <laughs> but, no, I'm telling you. But what, <laughs> <laughs> what I think uh, it it would have done not only what I do, but so many artists on the continent of Africa, or from the continent of Africa, uh, are visible in places that just a couple of years back you would have thought of them being seen in. And uh, I should think that that's a positive uh, thing uh, that's happening. No. Yeah, uh, that in fact leads me to another question, which is uh, there's no doubt that the advent of curators of African origin on the international contemporary art arena today, such as Oko Enoza, Olu Wibe, CCBC, uh, Sal Hassan, Yakuba Konate, and Gavin there somewhere. Chika Okeke, Ko Ko, Simon Njami, etc. Their presence is having a noticeable effect on the accession of African art on the international level. Having worked with most of these curators and many others of Western Orient, such as uh, Susan Vogel, the writer of, and researcher of your big book that's uh, available here, what would you say to the budding artists, because you're speaking to the young artists of the world today, what would you say is the role of a curator in an artist's life so far? If you could shed some light, because you've been working with curators. Well, I've worked with curators, all right, but uh, I think that uh, what has happened most of the time is that they give me the freedom, you know, to just do what, you know, maybe they have some bit of trust, and therefore what they do is just select me and say, okay, we have this uh, project and we think you should look at this uh, portion for us and leave me to, they give me the freedom to, to do whatever I want. <coughs> You know, uh, but in a couple of cases, they, I think we won one one case. 
I'm at the curator cam and uh, say, okay, show me this, show me that, show me that, and let me uh, decide what to do. And well, this was about uh, about the curator was thinking about an exhibition to mark my my 70th birthday and <laughs> and at the end of it decided that artworks are not going to be part of it and so selected things like uh, well things that have to do my, with the rest of my life apart from from artworks and uh, these were the things that were put on exhibition things like uh, the first box that I packed my artworks in when I moved from Ghana to Nigeria, you know, it's now very old and uh, <laughs> and with the inscription and everything on it, and, and then my uh, pay slips, pay slips over about 30 years, you know, and such. Uh, but, but I call them memorabilia, or, well, yeah, such, such objects, you know, which uh, they put on show. And when I went to see the show, I was uh, uh, well happy because it got me also to know more about myself. You know, uh, well, these are things which have been with me, but. When they are, when things are on show, they acquire different uh, status, and therefore the attention you give to them is different. And uh, it showed me how I had grown from. The, so that's one example of uh, uh, a curator um, working with material that I think curators mostly are also artists. Yeah, what they do is art. They might not call themselves artists, but, but what the, a, a, large of, a large chunk of their work is, uh, is uh, creative, you know, and a good example was this one that I've uh, cited, you know. So maybe what I'll tell young artists, I don't know if young artists even listen. As an artist, I think I don't listen to. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, so I don't know what I'm, I'm, I'll be, well, what I, well there's nothing uh, wrong with working with curators and there yeah, are people that you can interact with and uh, probably get something new out of it if the chemistry works right. Yeah. Well, uh, that's a very good response. Um, I quote you. Human life is constantly in motion. Ella Nasui. This was in conversation with CCBC, I think, when she was doing uh, your 70th birthday celebration uh, at uh, the CCA in Lagos. What does this quote mean to the young creative mind? Human life is constantly in motion. Yeah, I think uh, uh, what I've always said that well, that that is, I think I've earlier mentioned what I do with uh, with the act of my process and the intention or intent of work that, and I've mentioned the non-fixed form, you know, and that is as a result of my belief, or, well, I think not, not only my belief, but I think all of us know that life is not something which is static. It's something which is forever being affected by so many things, and the greatest of them is time, you know, time. And, uh, well, if all of us go back and look at our childhood photographs and then look at what the results are now, you agree with me that this is the, the time is one of the uh, greatest, the most dynamic uh, uh, 
artists. And therefore, uh, I believe that artworks to, you know, should emulate that quality of time as something which changes things. So that uh, that's why my pieces, you know, are meant to change every time that they are installed. You know, every time that they are installed, they should, in order to uh, replicate this dynamism of of uh, change, which is a very uh, strong element in uh, human life. Not only human life, in all, all life, in, in all of nature, you know, yeah, so that is... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's what you understand. Uh, lastly, in Africa we believe that uh, when a child is born, it does not belong to the particular parents it's born of but belongs to the entire village. Now that you have won the Golden Lion, a Lifetime Achievement Award, when are you going to bring it, this award to Zambia for us to join in with our <laughs> friends in Nigeria and in particular in Ghana who are waiting for this prize? Or when should I tell President Kaunda that you are coming to Osaka to bring the award for us to share in the celebration? <laughs> yeah, I think you are right in saying that in Africa, when uh, a child is born, it doesn't belong to the parents only, but to the whole community, you know. And uh, so, following that dictum or whatever. I think uh, I don't mind if I have an invitation to to come to Zambia <laughs> or, <laughs> any, in, or anywhere in Africa, <laughs> you know, with the lion yeah. in a cage. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. And uh, I think uh, at this point in time, really, for me, uh, yeah, uh, I would like to say that. Uh, uh, I'm sure the way hell feels is exactly the way I feel. It's like we are seated in Insuka, Lusaka, or Hama, you know, having a discussion of this kind. I think it uh, takes us inside the dynamics of, uh, you know, the creative, you know, the people like, uh, you know, uh, Elana Sui here. And uh, I, I'm the one who's been asking questions, and you have been doing the listening, I'm sure there should have been questions to say, oh, maybe, what about this? So we can open the floor for uh, a few questions that you'd like to pose to Elana Sui or myself. And, uh, yeah, you've been uh, great listeners. <coughs> Any? Yeah, Ingrid? Um, you called the exhibition C. C. The exhibition. Okay, okay. Uh, can you can you tell us something about why do you choose that name of the whole exhibition? Okay. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, the title G G. Well, I I come from a, a, a language uh, which uh, is. Very tonal. If I, all languages are tonal, I don't know of any language is not tonal. But, but uh, beauty or something I've discovered by, about my language is that they, when they write, most languages will write and put tone marks, like French, you know, <laughs> rise, fall, and the rest. And in my language, they write, I haven't seen it tone marked. They write the word and, that, and, and leave it to. to group or to find out what the inflection should be, maybe based on the, on the context or, you know, or, 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 or on anything, you know, that you can hang it on. And uh, so
So a word spelled this way it means so many uh, things. And uh, I thought that that is a very good uh, uh, way of thinking about art. Art is something which is, is a statement which would mean different things to different people. And uh, well, the word I selected for this exhibition, G, D Z I, in my language, can mean give birth to. At one time, at another, it could mean sing. Any at another one, it could mean increase. And at with another inflection, it could mean search for. And yet another inflection could mean the heart. The heart is like, yeah. And so on and so forth, you know. So I thought the uh, all those attributes uh, <laughs> go with the works that I produced for this uh, exhibition. You know, they are all from the heart, and uh, <laughs> some are songs which you listen to for either their beauty or. Or if you understand the lyrics <laughs> for their lyrics, or so and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. So the so the, the the word actually has got a lot of meaning uh, yes. to it, depending on how you uh, apply it mm -hmm. here. I also would like maybe before another question comes in. Uh, your insistence on these works being sculptures. Uh, I, 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 because the, the work relate to so many people, those who are in the fabric uh, industry, uh, they would want to call them, you know, war hangings or bats or something. Why, why do you insist uh, on this being sculptures? And I actually thought that maybe it's because you insist that this is made out of material that has been touched by people. So it should not be referred to as recycling. Maybe it's, it's life cycling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. The, uh, two words you mentioned. And, uh, uh, recycling. And what I need you to know. Life cycling. Yeah, recycling uh, and uh, no, there's another thing you mentioned. Uh, why they are, I insist that they are sculptures. God, they, they are sculptures, that, that's what they are. And <laughs> my, my classroom definition for a sculpture, which I think is right, is something to do with shaping. Shaping, and these are things that I create for you to shape, or for me to shape. Mm -hmm. You know, so they are sculptures, uh, different from uh, maybe people at times refer to them as tapestries. I don't know that they they shape tapestries. They hang, you know, in a particular way, mm -hmm. and they are not paintings. They have color, right, but they are not paintings only. They have the capacity to be uh, uh, shaped and reshaped and reshaped all over the place, you know. And, you know, yeah, let me tell uh, a story where the freedom that I say people don't take to play with the work, you know, was uh, subverted in one of the most unlikely places. You know, I was invited to the Vatican uh, to, to contribute a work for a show in the Vatican to mark the 50th 
year of 50th anniversary of, uh, of administration of the last pope. You know, so I created this piece and sent it to them, no instructions. And then I was curious, say, okay, these people who are used to Sistine Chapel, where the, the painting is fixed, and, <laughs> and uh, how are they going to uh, react to this? How are they going to, you know, relate to this free piece which has no instructions and they, they don't know which part is the top or which is the bottom, which is left, which is right, and no such thing. So for that reason, I went to the opening and entered the room and to my greatest surprise, they had used that freedom very, very effectively and created you know, something which took away. The, the, the work was almost like this one, which had four corners, but I couldn't see any of the corners. You know, the four corner idea was completely obliterated, and in its place, it was something else. And I saw that they, they put it on the board and even threw a portion of it behind the, the board. You know, I said, wow, this is the freedom that I've seen being exercised in a place that are associated with uh, uh, con conservatism. Mm -hmm. The church should be the most conservative place. <laughs> but here they are doing, they, they're taking great freedom and, uh, you know, doing that uh, uh, installation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, recycling, yeah. Um, recycling is not what uh, I think I do when I use bottle caps. Uh, and I think any artist who is using any other medium, any, any object, is not recycling. You know, they are using them as materials. In my case, I use them as material. I'm not recycling them. Because I believe that when you recycle, you are, you are creating a cycle. Recycled water is dirty and is purified and come back to be used as water, and, you know. Uh, but bottle caps are not here as bottle caps any longer. They are transformed into a different uh, uh, stage, you know, uh, probably higher stage than. Uh, so they are not going back into a cycle. So it's not recycling. Oh. Thank you. Yes, please. <clears throat> Thank you for your talk. Um, I have lots of questions in my head, but um, there are two that, in particular, talk, there's been a lot of talk about Africa and you representing Africa. And do you feel the pressure? Um, because I'm thinking if there was an artist, say, in Norway, or in the States, would the culture aspect be, um, would they feel the need to represent their culture as much as an artist like yourself coming from Africa, Ghana, Nigeria? Because there seems to be a lot of focus on <coughs> the culture. Do you feel pressure to keep that up and talk about you coming from Ghana? Now living in Nigeria, you as, as an African artist, um, how do you feel about that? Or um, do you feel that we become symbol or a token for Africa? You know, is this the whole continent? It's a very big responsibility. Yeah, I think in uh, in I think in all all people in the world have. Uh, were precon preconceived ideas yeah, about other cultures, you know. <laughs> we also have preconceived ideas about Europe, about Asia, about, you know, so, <laughs> and those things take a long time to, uh, to be educated out of. You know, yeah, it is true that uh, when I come to 
places outside of Africa, uh, people want to think that what I do is just taken from my culture, you know, uh, and taken from the culture without any uh, intervention or anything, which is not uh, true, you know, uh, because as an artist, I don't believe in just taking the thing lock, stock, and barrel, and then presenting it without my having uh, done anything to uh, maybe enhance or, or interpret it, you know, in some way, you know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Does that answer any question? <laughs> maybe, maybe I could, uh, you know, um, being an artist as well, I could uh, uh, chip in there. Uh, really, for those of us who are artists uh, living on the continent, we are not very concerned whether what we are doing is African art or it's uh, European art or anything like that. We are just concerned about responding to the environment in which we live because the influences that we are surrounded by is what uh, you know, uh, we, we, you see in our works, and not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, trying to represent Africa. Because, I mean, look at her, and I see he could be a, an artist uh, in Japan or in Alaska, and so on. But I think this is the issue of the, the, the Western world or the outsider trying to try and understand what we are doing. But I don't think, uh, uh, Professor, you can agree with me that uh, that pressure is not really there. Maybe the pressure is with the people that are consuming <laughs> what we are doing. <laughs> That's the way I see it. Yeah, and, it, it, and it's, uh, it tends to inhibit, you know, further understanding. Uh, for instance, when the, this uh, kind of pieces came out at first. Well, the first two that I did, I called them man's cloth and woman's cloth. Now, that, well, because they are, they have the, the, the quality of fabric, you know, they are, she, they are in, in sheet form and, uh, and have the freedom of, you know, being used just like sheet of cloth, you know. But then there was a very glaring uh, aspect of them which I think escaped everybody. The man's cloth was really huge, big, you know, which in, in real life is what we, uh, because in my part of the world we wear the, the cloth, you know, both men and women, and the, the, the one for men is really big. And the one for women is small, you know. And I was hoping that uh, people would have seen the, you know, idea of gender inequality, you know, in it. But then everybody was carried away by the color scheme, which uh, looked like. The color scheme of a very iconic cloth in my part of, uh, in, in my country, the Kente cloth. You know, and so everybody who wrote about the uh, pieces talked about them as far as to Kente cloth. They built their cases as far as to Kente cloth. And that, <laughs> you know, they, they are looking for my culture in, 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 in the work only, and not the meaning. Of, of the work, you know, yeah. The, the other question, just quickly, is that um, looking at the artist's practice, you, because you described about you worked early with wood, how did, how did it move to, because wood and metal, or scraps of metal, very different materials, um, do you think you would, um, Transgress. Do you think you would move to another material later on? Do you feel that? Um, do 
you feel that you're going to be finished with this kind of work? What, what kind of materials do you think you, you might be interested in working later on? Have you had any? Well, the, 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 way, the way that materials, I think they have come to me, not, not uh, necessarily me selecting the way they, they, they show up and then I look at them and discover that they have potential to be used, like the wood the idea just showed up on its own and uh, I worked with it for a long time and then the metals also showed up by accident and then uh, I I have been working with them since 1999 and uh, so on and so forth. Elia wants to did uh, come to me in that way. So as an artist, I am constantly searching for. But I keep my mind open and my eyes open for any material which might have potential. Do you, need, do you feel you need to continue? I tell you that this, when I started, I thought it was going to be just those two pieces, man's club and woman's club. Yeah. You know, because I didn't think that as a medium it was going to have a long run. It, I thought it was going to have a very short run. Mm -hmm. But as I continued exploring or working more with it, it kept revealing new ideas and I kept discovering new ways of uh, handling it, that's why I've stayed along with it. And it could be knocked off by any other medium that comes and, and shows that it has a, a maybe stronger potential, you know, than it. I don't know yet what it, it, it is, you know, that will come. I thought you might start exploring already. Uh, well, occasionally I have consciously started uh, mixing uh, wood and, and, and a bottle cap. Yeah, the metal and the wood, you know, in some, you know, exploring that uh, possibility. Uh, but that's too conscious, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, we can go on and on, but uh, I think. Uh, uh, we can take the last two. Yeah, uh, Gabi. Uh, I just wanted to. You were asked a question earlier about uh, the contribution that the continent the African art is making to the Western canon. Mm -hmm. And the way you answered it through the number of other questions which have been asked. But the thing that comes very clearly to me is that all the categories that Western art has established mm -hmm. for itself which it assumes to cast on everyone else, doesn't fit your work. In other words, you're breaking all the rules. So you're a primary rule breaker. You talk, uh, you know, you talk about wall hangings and tapestries and painting, all these references that get thrown at your work, which simply your work is not. It's none of these things. You talk about it in terms of sculpture, you talk about sculpture in terms of form, and of course sculpture in terms of the Western canon is something that's three-dimensional. Mm -hmm. uh, so your things hang on the wall, they're flat, they are low relief, mm -hmm. they're not, you don't see them from behind, or very seldom if you, if you I've seen them from behind. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way you're kind of a, a, a rule breaker, mm -hmm. and you seem to enjoy that. And so I think if we were to say what is your contribution, it's simply to undermine and put a big question mark on all those established canons that are used in the discourses of art to say this fits into this little box because your work simply doesn't want to fit into those boxes. Uh, you know, you talked about the references people made to Kente Kulon, which is a traditional work place. The reference is there. But it's an utterly modern usage of that tradition. So at the same time, it's like saying there's a there's a Goya painting reference in a contemporary painter's work, and somehow they, both languages are present. So that's another rule breaking right? because contemporary art is certainly about finding new languages, not reformulating old ones. And I think that's another aspect of the work that I admire greatly. Break all the rules, step across all the boundaries, and 
still fascinate purely visually for what it is that, as you say, today people are more concerned about talking about what the word is mm. rather than its references mm. to existing categories of the Western category. Mm. Am I correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Do you want to? Uh, yeah, I think, I think that, uh, yeah, you say about the uh, breaking rules, and I think <laughs> rules are there to, to know, yeah, ru rules are there to know. What, what I've done, I think, is to, to know a little bit of the rule, and, uh, and uh, like you say, sculpture, three-dimensional, and you can go behind it. And, uh, when this work started, the first ones, the first two that I did, the man, the man's cloth, woman's cloth, were actually uh, on 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 the wall. They were right in the middle of the this thing hanging, mm -hmm. hanging, so I could go around. Them. So, so, but but it happened that when uh, they came out, most of the exhibition places that you go to have copious supply of wall space only. So they ended up being hanging on the wall. And even in uh, most cases, you find that they are multi-sided. You can, you know, all the sides are viable, you know. There are some that you turn the side and you turn the other side and it's, it's still uh, okay. So I, I think I, yeah, I agree that I break rules all right, but then, yes, rules are just beginning points for me to or they provide what there is to break, you know. And I think Governor, you have just provided a very good uh, uh, analysis of what is going on in general. And uh, I sometimes uh, feel sorry to the Western canon that they are going to miss a generation of evolution because there are things that are happening uh, and, uh, which artists living in far-flung places are coming up, which actually are a challenge to the established knowledge about what art should be. Uh, you've broken it down very, very well. Uh, I, I, I think we are, we are trying to do something different. Yeah. And uh, I must say that I think the West is uh, very lucky to have the likes of you and the Okwes who are bringing these things to your front before you. They can just go pass by because there will be just a generation of innovation from the far-flung places that you are going to miss. Uh, because some of it is not really falling within the brick and mortar uh, category. It's uh, transgressing all the established, uh, you know, maybe theoretical technical knowledge and stuff like that. So that's why I think uh, Ellie is one of those who are actually just on that trajectory of doing things as he feels like doing them. And it's going on like that. And I feel like my appeal to Western uh, curators and Western you know, collectors is to really look out what is happening in the far-flying places, it could be quite uh, something amazing. Yeah. You had your hand up? Yeah, just, yeah. just a very, very short comment because there's a train going to Oslo in a minute. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I work with large tapestries and um, I see a lot of art. But when I saw your work, I was just, my heart started to beat very fast. And that's why I had to come here today. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I think all that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, you wanted to say yeah, something? I just wanted to give him support that for sure is a rule breaker, you know, because you can see as even broken the rule of where I'm stalking is. He has two colors of the same makeup. <laughs> That's art. <laughs> is uh, there any contribution? Uh, if there isn't, make, maybe we can, um, uh, from my side of things, really, I think this has been uh, 
quite a very great moment. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Professor for having uh, uh, accepted that uh, I come all the way from the southern tip of uh, the continent to come and join in the celebration here at Hama and to just thank the beautiful ladies at Hama and men that are doing it all. And, uh, thank you for your patience.